engine stops, we are prison now. If you have hate in your heart, let it out. Our press secretary gave alternative facts. Uh, look, I'm not racist, but... You're pretty close to going to hell. I am a strong, independent woman, and I will get on a table, because this is my right, America. Boy. What up, this is Ian Elliott Carter, and welcome to the Intellectual Controverse Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Intellectual Controverse. I'm Ian Elliott Carter, and I have a very special guest with me. Um, somebody that's very controversial and not holding back in anything. Nothing. Mr. Jamil Davis, how are you? I'm good, sir. How about yourself? Doing great, man. I'm glad you could bring it down here to um to Panama City. I'm glad to be in the building man. with my man Ian. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm very, very <laughs> proud of you, man, as far as this podcast, bro. I've been waiting on I've been waiting on this for a minute. So Okay. Yeah, we about to Oh yeah, let's, let's get in, man. <laughs> I noticed though, like, since you you've moved to Pensacola, but you've been traveling a lot. I have, man. I, I didn't mean to ask you about that. Like one day I look online and you're like in um, New Orleans. You're like maybe I think maybe Orlando or you've been Alabama. You've been going everywhere. What what's the deal with that? Um, basically, man. As soon as I got to Pensacola, everything just started kind of like falling into place, going into motion. I've been doing a lot of shows, a lot of out of town shows, okay. and one show led to another one and led to another one. Initially, I did my first real out of the state show mm -hmm. in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. From the Baton Rouge show, um, I was able to get a halftime performance for a rugby, um, college rugby tournament in oh. Atlanta. Mm. Um, and then also from the Baton Rouge show, I was able to get another show in New Orleans. Mm. And then I just, last week, literally last Friday, I just opened up for Tank and the Bangers. Okay. In um, Orange Beach, Alabama. Um, awesome. Tank and the Bang is there. They won the NPR Tiny Desk Contest. Okay. And they were National able to Public do radio. Yeah, right. you know, that, that <laughs> lovely stuff. So, yeah, man. Just, you know, I'm working, man. You are working. making moves. You are working, man. <laughs> you are making moves, man. I'm proud of you because um, I've known you since about, I think, 2011 mm -hmm. when I met you. Yep. And we met, I was actually, um, me and a guy named Ja, we were we were doing this thing called Therapy Thursday. We do it like once a month um, during the summertime. And he he reached out and he wanted you, and I think you, you came at me as well, wanting to be on the menu. I had no idea who you were or nothing yeah. like that, but your determination, I was like, okay, well, I need, I need people on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I didn't know much about you. I didn't know any of your music. I didn't know any of your poetry. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, when this guy got on stage and, and spit one of his um, poems, I don't remember what it was, because it was, like I said, 2011. Yeah. Beautiful. Probably one of the best poems I've heard, like, from when I was hosting. And um, this guy, he's got a real talent. He's, he's real artistic. And when it comes to being artistic, I notice with myself personally, yeah. there comes a lot of um, emotion. Oh, yeah. you could, you know, I, I'll be the first to tell you right now, I'm an emotional person. And I can tell you are as well. Yeah. And that's, that might be one reason we connect as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, we don't get too emotional. I've never seen the man cry. I, I like to do mine, you know, privately. Yeah, it's the man, it's the man, bro. <laughs> but um, there's there's a lot of emotion to to the things you write when it comes to po poetry, when it comes to um your your uh, art, as in hip hop. Um, is that the best way to get out your emotions? It really is, and especially this past year, within the last couple of months, it's been the best therapy mm -hmm. for me with everything that I've um, everything that I've encountered in life and everything that I'm going through now to be able to overcome a lot of just hurt. Right. You know. But also at the same time it allows me to when I don't want to get ultra emotional about certain things that's going on within our community or certain things that's going on um, with us as a people, I just come in the music. Right. That way, that emotion is out, mm -hmm. and now I can actually think with a clear conscience about what it is that we need to do. Right. As far as 
you know, coming up with solutions mm -hmm. to combat a lot of the things that's going on within within our community. Um, I've noticed, just for me personally, man, I've noticed that within the last maybe two two and a half two two and a half years, I've leaned more towards um, music that conveys a topic of social justice mm -hmm. and you know black empowerment yeah um you know before i i had some of that but it was more along the lines my, my music was more along the lines of allowing people to understand who i was as a person how i overcame a lot of obstacles and who helped me overcome a lot of obstacles yeah. um you know meaning you know, having a strong relationship with God and, you know, putting my faith in Jesus and, you know, just treading the way. Yeah. Now that you know and understand that side of me as a person, now I feel like with this season of music that I'm making now, it's time to understand the it's time to understand the man and it's time to understand what makes me the man what makes me the man that I am now. Okay, um, what you just said kind of reminded me of a quote uh, Pharrell said either at the, be the beginning of this year or at the end of last year. He said with all the stuff going on, whether it be like uh, social injustice, whether it be uh, not equal rights for, for blacks, but, um, the justice system, or even women not being treated right, he said that all that pain that's coming, like it's just balling up and balling up, and with that it's going to come like the best art, best music of all time. Yeah, he yeah. Gives. And I, I, I see where he's coming from that. And what you just said about the evolution of what, what you've been doing, I can see that within the way you speak, the what the actually your music as well. That pain that you brought out has brought out some of the best music I've seen in the 850. Man, I appreciate it. That's that. real. I definitely appreciate it, man. Thank you. So, yeah, man. Um Yeah, man, we got we got a lot of things we got a lot of things in the works this year, man. <laughs> and I'm I'm greatly excited. We you know we'll we'll get into that yeah a little a, a, a little bit later on. But like it's a lot a lot of stuff in the works right now. We actually just um, May nineteenth we actually just dropped a project um, just like a little quick strike EP project myself mm -hmm. and another MC that's out of here actually, but he now resides in Pensacola as well. Okay. Um, F A M E. Okay. We did a um project called Black Superhero Music. Awesome. And um, basically, what it is is it's it's gonna be a three volume set, mm -hmm. but each volume has kind of in the same frame of mind as like comic books. Each right. volume has issues, mm -hmm. um, and so the first issue of volume one, um, we focused on well, the first volume we're focusing on black comic book superheroes, mm -hmm. and so the first issue we focused on. Black Panther, Storm, and Luke Cage. Okay. But the thing that we wanted to do with those, um, thing that we wanted to do basically with the comic book heroes, we don't use, for the titles of the songs, we don't use their actual superhero names. Mm -hmm. We use their real life name, name, yeah. names, aliases. Okay. So, so like, um, what well, about the Sunny Me, right? For people, mm -hmm. like Falcon, you would say, uh, this is Sam Wilson. Is right, like okay. exactly. So with this one, um, the one that we just dropped, it's T'Challa, mm -hmm. Aurora, Monroe. And that's Black Panther and Storm. Storm, okay. And then Carl Lucas. Carl which Lucas is Luke Cage. Yeah, Luke Cage. Um, because the one thing that we want to do is we want for just ordinary people to understand that you can be a superhero as well. Of course. Because if you never knew anything about Black Panther, mm -hmm. you would still know that T'Challa is the king. Yeah. Is the king of Wakanda. I'm interested in what you're going to do with Cyborg because that's out of all the black superheroes, that's probably the one I know the least about. Uh, I, and not, now that I hate DC, I have me and my friend Brandon, <laughs> we go back and forth about DC and Marvel. He thinks I hate DC and I think he hates Marvel, but I honestly don't know much about Cyborg. I know he was like a uh, he was a, a football player at one point and his father experimented mm -hmm. on him after an accident. I mean, it's interesting though because like the ones that we have upcoming. Um, for volume one, mm -hmm. I think we may only have one, one DC really superhero. I think everybody else is everyone else is more. You know, it's crazy. We we might just like linked up and just thought that maybe DC is lacking on a uh, color 
colored um a little bit yeah because I mean, well, you know, cyber is the only one I can think of right now and um Green Lantern Green Lantern yes yeah. and that's actually that's my favorite Green Lantern out of all of them with yeah. John Stewart Stewart yeah mm-hmm. so that's only two though Marvel has like not even so many black characters they also they do a good job with varieties they they brought up Asian characters they have a new right. hope that's Asian they've um. I think Stan Lee's like I need to. He he wants to make it a, a goal of his before he dies to put out a Latin superhero that's out there and out front. Nice. Yeah. So he he's very he's very good with diversity for an old white man too. That's very exactly. Rare. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I mean like he, I mean he's the one that like he's pretty much the one that's created all of these superheroes mm-hmm. within the Marvel universe, including the African American one. Right. And it's interesting, man. He um he said in an interview that. Um, which to me, I thought about it at first, and I was like, "Yeah, it does make sense." But um, X Men mm-hmm. was based off of MLK, MLK, and, and um, Malcolm X. X. Yeah, like, um, Professor Xavier is MLK, and Magneto mm-hmm. is Malcolm X. And I said, and I thought about it. I was like, "Yeah." yeah. You, you said, if you know the history between Malcolm X and, and uh, Martin Luther King, where they they had like a little rivalry, they they were they had the same goal, but just had different ways of going about it. Right. And that's exactly what uh, uh, Professor Man, Xavier and yeah, exactly. They really had the same goal for human um, uh, uh, mutant rights, but one one wants to do a more peaceful way, and one's like, you know what, we're gonna do the raw approach. Nobody's listening to us. Let's just do it this way. And so the crazy thing about that, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine because we were talking about like superhero music and all of that uh-huh. and I brought that up in the conversation they were like well how come they could how come Stan Lee couldn't have just done you know MLK instead of Professor Xavier and Malcolm X instead of Magneto I was like I said so think about it in this fashion mm-hmm. if you're doing this comic book where you want people to focus on human rights mm-hmm. especially human rights for African Americans would you just blatantly put it in their face? Yeah. Or would you just feed them applesauce right. with their pills mm-hmm. by, oh, this is about mutant rights. Yeah. And you have Professor Xavier who wants to go about it in a peaceful, nonviolent manner. Mm-hmm. And then you have Magneto who's like, we, we're going to get rights for our people mm-hmm. by any means right. necessary. But in the end, both of them want rights right. for the entire mutant race. Of course. And the guy, he sat there and thought about it. He was like, yeah. It's true. Nobody's going, he was like, nobody's going to want to read a comic book where human rights yeah. is blatantly thrown in there. And when, when, you're, when you're ignorant to a situation like civil rights or, or human rights, period, mm-hmm. You, you, if I'm ignorant on a lot of things, like I'll give you an example, car maintenance. I don't know nothing about the units, but if you threw out everything about what I need to do with my car, I'm gonna be like, I don't know what all this means. I don't know what his terms mean. But if you do it like in a slow process, like like they do with X Men, I will I will learn this knowledge and I'll and I'll start connecting dots. Like, oh, this is what you meant by that. This is a parallel of this and that and that. So that that's very good. And he, and the subject of mutants too is it's just so elementary but so like um very knowledgeable when it comes to civil rights i like how he does that yeah. because when you look at it from whatever race you are looking at the x-men you're like wow what is i would love to be i would love to have that those special powers why would you hate on something like that mm-hmm. and then you parallel it to our world like okay Look at it from our point of view. Why would you hate on a black person? They're just a human being like us. Why would you not treat them fairly and stuff like that? And it, it's really elementary and, and simple, but sometimes it needs to be uh, spread out yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, man, the way the way it was addressed was is, a, is addressed very very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I think that's our. That's our objective with black superhero music. Right. So that's why we initially started volume one with the comic book characters. Okay. Because volume two is actually going to be the um, black historical figures and black social justice awesome. leaders. And then um, volume three is actually going to be um, the Orisha gods. Okay. Um, touching on the African spirituality system. Um, Ifa and Orisha, you know, and just um, focusing that, focusing on that as well, um, getting to know a lot of individuals that actually practice in that spiritual system. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm understanding that 
they do actually recognize um, Jesus as in as in Orisha God, but like oh. the highest form of Orisha God. But like, yeah, it's, off camera, you have to tell me a little bit about that. I'm oh, just, oh, yeah, of course, that's definitely. really cool, man. Yeah, man. Well, speaking of social justice warriors, man, um, what do you think about the? I'd say there's a boom in them right now, yeah. and I would consider you one, and don't take offense to it, because I would consider you one, but you're not, that's not all you do, mm-hmm. and we, I could bring up your credentials all day, with you out there protesting, out there speaking to, to the head folks, um, you have a you have a pretty good resume when it comes to not just talking, but doing as well, and anybody that knows him knows this. Right. I, I, would, I would call you that, though, because every time I get on social media, you are bringing awareness mm-hmm. to things I've not heard yet, and... Um, you are pretty much my CNN at times to to what's going on in the black community. Um, but what are your thoughts on social justice warriors here in 2017? Um, it's a lot of them, bro. Like just like you said, it is a lot of them. But you kind of have to differentiate between those who talk the talk and those who are going to actually put their money where their mouth is. Absolutely. Um, I'm very very. Like I'm, I'm very, very gracious to be able to follow through social media, mm-hmm. or just follow through, um, follow through email or whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. Individuals such as uh, Sean King. Right. Sean King is awesome. Yeah. Um, Sean King, and he's still a lot of people thinks that he's not, but he still is going forth with the injustice boycott that he initially started back in back on. Um, Christmas Day okay. of last year, um, but there has been many, many strides with that boycott. Um, being able to have the entire city of Seattle um, divest their funds from um, Wells Fargo mm-hmm. because Wells Fargo invests invests in the um, Detroit, the Dakota okay. access pipeline. Yeah, there Wells Fargo can go through a lot. Um, that's uh, that's one of the main things. They also have a. Uh, Situations where people were being the, the the people were stealing from the customers as well. Exactly. So I wouldn't bank with Wells Fargo for regardless nothing. of nothing. <laughs> yeah, just, that's not a smart decision. <laughs> nothing, nothing at all. Um, but yeah, being able to have the city of Seattle do it, uh-huh. um, and if I'm not mistaken, the city of San Diego did okay. it as well. So like literally the entire city's money is completely divested from this bank, and they put it into another bank that doesn't support Dakota Access um, Pipeline. Um, also, looking at individuals such as the Dream Defenders, they're based out of, based out of Tallahassee. Right. Um, they were able to go to Palestine oh. to work over, do um, social justice work over in Palestine. Those are some brave cats right um, there. Yeah, definitely, man. Like, and they've been, they've actually been around since the acquittal of George Zimmerman back in 2013 mm-hmm. um, and great 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 group um, shout out to Omi Salah and um, Sierra Taylor um, two of the people that I have personally connected with through um, Dream Defenders Omi Salah of course is the um, president of the entire organization and um, Sierra Taylor she's actually the political director okay. of, of that movement um, and of course, um, you know, no social justice movement can go without speaking on Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Um, which at first just started out as just a simple hashtag and then just a movement, but they actually grew into an organ an organization mm-hmm. um, of their own with many many chapters across the country. Um, and I'm I'm liking how within the last I'd say six to seven months, they've actually been able to put out and draw up a platform yes. um, that they can introduce to um, political political leaders and polit- um, political leaders and elected officials to let them know, okay, as a movement and as as a movement and as a people, mm-hmm. this is this is specifically what we want. Right. This is specifically what you need to give us, and if not, then. This is what we're going to do, okay. and it's not going like it's not going to be of a violent nature. But if it has to reach that point, then 
God help us all. Back on the subject of Black Lives Matter, um, and you you saying it's developing better right. because I've had I support Black Lives Matter a hundred percent. I had the only criticism I had though it didn't seem like it had a leader, and I'd say um, the Civil Rights Movement they had they had that they had their leaders they had organization it was really respected through all sides. The only thing would seem like Black Lives Matter because it did start as a hashtag, like you said. It yeah. just seems like, yeah, I'm a Black Lives Matter supporter. I'm this, I'm that. But okay, so what are you? Are we gonna? Are we gonna um, march? Are we gonna get all together? Are we gonna have these meetings? No, I'm just gonna repost what the homeboy said, and that that was my issue with Black Lives Matter. Um, of course, I supported it through and through, but it just seems like it didn't have a leader or a face, and it still kind of doesn't. But I'm glad you're saying that um, that it's that it's um, progressing. Uh, what would you say about people that, that would claim this to be like a terrorist group comparing it to like the KKK or ISIS or something stupid like that? Well, every organization has the quote unquote bad, bad apples of the bunch. Absolutely. But the entire organization as a whole, which um, you have Black Lives Matter as the organization, and then of course you have the Black Lives Matter network, mm -hmm. which um, grew and matriculated to the movement. Now it's now known as the Movement for Black Lives, okay. which um, that would be several organizations in the country that promote the ideals of Black Lives Matter and um, social equality for all people. Right. Um, for you know, for you to say, for anybody to say that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization, then you would be speaking not only on just Black Lives Matter as an organization, mm -hmm. you would be speaking against the NAACP, right. you'd be speaking against the Dream Defenders, the Urban League, mm -hmm. um, 100, Black Men of, 100 Black Men of America, which that organization stretches out across many campuses um, in the country, um, not, not even just HBCUs, but also predominantly white institutions as well. Right. So for you to even state that that's the case would be completely and utterly out of line. Yeah. Um, because it's been stated time and time again that the reason behind Black Lives Matter. I was about to ask you, can you, mm -hmm. for these simple minded people that you want to say that, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm tired of defending as well, but I want this on camera so every time someone asks, I can bring back this. Like, I'm just going to play this. Yes. <laughs> so break down the solution, the, uh, the reasoning and the solution of Black Lives Matter for these people that don't understand it. They just might watch Fox News and get their you know information. Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter as in. As a movement, mm -hmm. as a movement itself, um, began due to the murders of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, um, and Oscar Oscar Grant, um, but mainly just the the first three that I named. And basically, it was it had gotten to a point where we as African Americans tired of feeling as though our lives were treated as second rate and our citizenship we were being treated as second class yes I mean I, I totally and completely understand that within the um, within the 13th amendment of the constitution it states that yeah we, we are free but even that has a loophole in it within itself. Check out Netflix thir thir uh, 13. 13. See awesome. what he's talking about. Yeah. Awesome. Completely awesome. And so um, the country has allowed itself to even use that as a way to still um, enslave people of color. Mm -hmm. um, but it's gotten to the point where it's like there is an issue where systemic racism and the murders of unarmed black people because it's no longer just like because cause at first everybody was like oh, okay well it's just unarmed black men no now it's becoming an issue where it's just all of us period yeah. um, 
And the thing is, this this isn't a black issue. This isn't a white issue, man. This is a human issue. Yes, I said that on my podcast with uh, J- uh, Jemiah and Alex. Mm-hmm. I said there's no such thing as a black issue. If you claim to be an American citizen, and these are American people, they're not treated being treated to their uh, constitutional rights. The justice system is uh, failing them multiple right. times. You got to look past the race thing when it comes to not being treated fairly. If you are an American, why aren't you fighting for American rights? Exactly. And, and and that's the thing, like, it now has to be recognized as being a human issue. Mm-hmm. And I think, that, I think the issue that a lot of people have with it is just that we we focus on just those three words, black lives matter. Yeah. What do you mean all lives matter? Exactly, but... No, many times it, I've heard that. Yeah. It, it, Does that affect you? know how many times I've heard that? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, black lives? Black what black about me? I'm, I'm white. <laughs> My life doesn't matter. I'm not, so I'm does, not, the does, the term, <laughs> does the term all lives matter offend you? Yes, it does. And explain why it does. It's explain ter- the uh, difference right there and why it does offend It terribly you. offends me. And the reason that it does is because... Okay, I give you a prime example. So, um, we have breast cancer walks, breast cancer awareness walks every year. So, I'm not gonna go to this breast cancer awareness walk, and the first thing that comes out of my mouth, how come we walking for breast cancer? <laughs> what about leukemia? Right. What about syphilis? What about HIV? I mean, you know. <laughs> All diseases matter. It's not just about breast cancer. And I had that same conversation with someone else, and they were like, "No, Jamil, that's not the same." They're like, "No, that's definitely the same." I don't it's, know how much more I'm like, you can make it after that. It's completely the same <laughs> because I mean, we're not trying to say all these other lives uh-huh. don't have value. We're trying to let you know that our life, our lives as African Americans within this country. Our lives have value. Mm -hmm. Our lives have great value. And within the last few years, it's been shown. Like, it's it's been more than shown that you're not really valuing it quite well. You know, whether killings of unarmed individuals, the the blatant and total disrespect Mm -hmm. of um, the last president that we had and the last administration that just came out, like, I don't know anybody that's been as disrespected as a, as a president. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm glad you said that. I actually just had a post. I wanted to see people's ex- opinions on the matter. Right. Who do you think has been the media tr- uh, has treated worse, uh, Trump or, or Obama? You know, my opinion, obviously, is I think Obama was a tre- uh, treated worse. I do think that the media targeted both of them equally. Right. But here's my difference. They targeted Obama for issues that didn't even make any sense. That they just made up stuff. You're, you're a guy that has no birth certificate. You're from Africa. You're a Muslim. All, all this made up nonsense that anybody with a book can realize to debunk real in 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. But everything that they're targeting Trump for... It, it's got I some. Mean, yeah. it's, it's sticking a little it's bit. It's sticking a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> they keep uh, they keep uh, accusing him to have ties with Russia. Well, if you have a meeting with Russia and you're telling them the issue, um, telling them our secrets. Yes, we're going to ask questions. We're going to come at you. <laughs> see, he wants to play this victim stuff, but it, it just the, you guys don't see the difference. What Obama went through, he had to work a little bit harder, and I do think it was because he was black. He had to he had to be the bigger man more times than he needed to be. You know, he, he was very mature about it. Tony Hishi Coates said something really great on um, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah uh-huh. the day after, um, well, no, the week after um, Donald Trump became president because he wrote an article in The Atlantic Magazine right. um, about President Obama. Um, and what he said on The Daily Show, um, I get his point, man. He was like, so Obama had to be. Dang, they're topping his class mm-hmm. at Columbia University. Graduate from there, become the president of Princeton Law Review, mm-hmm. and do all this countless activism work in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Become a senator. Mm-hmm. He had to do all of this just to become president of the United States. Right. And Donald Trump 
All he had to do was run just be about, white. Just be white. <laughs> and that shock value, <laughs> you know. And, and one thing I heard, which I, I think this, a comedian actually said this, I don't remember who said it, and, mm -hmm. I, and it seems like it's true. If you look through history, you know, as far as it goes back with cameras and audio, he said that the funniest president wins every time. And as much as I don't like Donald Trump, he was funnier than Hillary's. It was, it was just keep it real. It was more entertaining. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously, the people that Obama went against, <laughs> funnier. But the case is about as funny as like um, I don't know a wet floor. There's nothing funny about exactly. that. Exactly. You know, and this, you know, and uh, Mitt Romney, he, just, he had a punchable face. Yeah, <laughs> funny, 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 yeah. funny about yeah. it. So, and I mean, Holyfield did punch it a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that, that's the theory when it comes to no matter what the issue is, it just seems like people just want to be entertained and right. the funniest person wins every time. I really wish it wasn't like that. I really think that, but that, I really think that's why these presidents win. Whoever does the most entertaining, whoever does, it doesn't even matter if you have solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. If you're making me smile, I might vote for you. Exactly. And that's if, sad. If that's you, really sad. If you can be a very nice looking and enjoyable figurehead yeah. during your tenure, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going. I'm going to put you in. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I've heard criticisms about you. Some to your face, and I've heard some behind your back. You know, and I'm not going to drop names or nothing like that. Mm -hmm. But it seems like you would know. You would know people are saying this about you. Some people would say that you might be over the top and extreme when it comes to issues of Black Lives Matter or just social it seems like you just talk about issues when it's just black people. Right. Um, what would you say to that? What would your response be to that? I'm black. I'm black. Good answer. What else? Yeah. I'm black. We're dying. What else do you want? <laughs> yeah, you know, like... Um, and you know, it's like, and I say that too, it's not even just white people that say that, though. There's some black people that even say that. Exactly. And, you know, I'm, I'm black. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that you sorry know. about blackness. <laughs> I'm sorry about blackness of men, too. And that kind of um, like ties in with my, and I don't know if you have any more to say to that. No, no, um, and, I mean, basically, honestly, man, um, I've heard it. Yeah. I've heard it numerous times. It's like, bro, like, you gotta really stop. You know, you got to put the picket sign down. Like, everything, like, it's not that serious every time. And my response to that is, if no one else says anything, I have to. Because if it's not said, then it becomes, it becomes a situation of the incident happens. Oh, man, that was awful. And then we start focusing on rompers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I have probably that. I'm here, I'm here for the jokes. I'm here for the jokes and the memes. But, like, <laughs> you know, like, I've had conversations with uh, a bunch of my other friends about this. They're like, yo, like, I hate when people get on and they'll be like, you know, don't let this romper thing distract you from the fact of blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, I can multitask. Yes. I'm very, I'm very, very multitasking good at that. individual. Very good. <laughs> like within minutes, you'll talk about a very, very uh, serious issue, mm -hmm. and that needs to have awareness. The next minute, you'll be you'll be clowning Steve Harvey or something like that. You know, you you're really good at that. <laughs> but um, one thing I know, I know the answer to this because I know you as a person. We've had this conversation right. multiple times. Okay, so tying in with why you go extreme, why do you go so hard for the movement? Why why does it build you up personally? Why do you feel that you need to be this way? Um. Because any one of those, any one of those names that we name or place as a hashtag, I could have easily been a hashtag. And there's a, 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 a background story to that. Oh right? yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. And, and so certain people will say that, and it'll just be the generalized thing of, oh, I'm black. So because I'm black, I could have been a hashtag. No, like I could have legitimately been a hashtag. And um. I was, I had to be 21, 22 at the time, coming out What of, are you, um, 56 now? Yeah, you know, right, 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 right around there. <laughs> I always find it. Right around right there. <laughs> but, um, nah, man, I was coming out of, um, coming out of church at the time. My, my stepfather, he passed to the church here in Panama. And I was coming out of the church, taking out the trash. And we literally lived, like, maybe 
three or four minutes from the church mm-hmm. that I could just easily walk home. So a friend of mine, his car had broken down um, at his girlfriend's house, and he was walking up the road. He's like, my car broke down. I need to call my mom. Is it possible for me? I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to the house. You can just come with me. Right as we're walking um, up Flower Avenue about to cross 15th Street, please car just come around the corner. And I'm like, okay, well, I know I just came out of church, so I know they're not yeah. focusing on me. So I keep walking until they get out of the car. And they're like, we need you to stop right now. And I'm like, okay, like, what's going on? So he's like, where did you, where are you all just coming from? I was like, well, my friend here, he was at his girlfriend's house, car broke down. I said, me, myself, I just came out of church. I said, we can go literally, because we were literally still standing in the middle of Flower Avenue on the corner of Flower and 15th, mm-hmm. and my dad's church literally sits right there. So we was literally right next to the church. And I was like, yeah, we go in right now. My dad will let you know where I was at. He was like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that later. Mm-hmm. Um, I, need to see, it, huh? yeah, I, I need to see some ID. And so everybody that knows me know I keep my wallet in my back pocket. So as I'm reaching for my wallet, real tall officer looks just like you know, if you ever seen Police Academy, Tackleberry, <laughs> literally looks just like Tackleberry. And as soon as I'm reached for my wallet, I get met with this Glock 9 in my face. And I'm like, I, now I'm mad. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, your partner just asked me for my ID. So I'm trying to get my ID. And um, so getting the ID, everything, next thing I know, we both being put in handcuffs. But unbeknownst to me, as I was reaching for my ID, one of the members of the church was coming out of the church because everybody was about to go to Applebee's. I was just going home just to, because I had my backpack, put my backpack and stuff away. My parents was going to come and pick me up and no one was going to go to Applebee's. He's walking out. He literally goes right back into the church. And I never forget his part of the story. He was like, man, I seen you. And he walked out right as the gun was being put in my oh, face. My so he was like, he's like, I saved your life. He was like, I seen it, and I immediately went right back in the church. And he was like, as soon as I went in, he's like, I look at nobody else in the church but your mom. Oh. And I was like, yeah. So Jamil's outside. There's two police officers in front of him. One of them just pulled a gun on him. And my mom was like, outside of here, yeah, everybody got up, walked outside. By the time they get outside, it's now three police officers and two police cars. And I'm in cuffs, and my friend is in cuffs. And so the third officer that had just gotten there informs my mom, well, there's been a brash of car robberies in the neighborhood, and your son and his friend fits the description of of the suspects. (laughs) And my mom looked at him and was like, you're lying. Um, I got a friend who's a detective for Panama City Police Department. I got another friend who's a lieutenant on Bay County Sheriff's Department. So what's going to happen is, is that you're going to get my son out of the handcuffs. And if not, then I'm going to have all y'all badges by Monday. What they do? I got out of the handcuffs. You got out of the handcuffs <laughs> real quick. Yeah. And so, um, literally, bro, like, had that been a scenario where two seconds after the gun gets pulled out, he decides trigger finger wants to get itchy, yeah, like yeah, that's that's a good whole that, different scenario. If that dude didn't run up in there and tell the church and tell your mother, man, who knows what would happen? Exactly, that's, that dude saved your life. You know what's crazy? Hearing that story, you're, you're not a father, but I am a father, mm-hmm. and not only am I a black person, well, I'm half black, but you know I. Seems like a lot of people don't even want to see the white side of me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's funny, like, from, that scares me as a black person, but as a father, it scares me even more. Right. Because I put myself in your mother's shoes in that story. Mm-hmm. More than more, more so here. That would break my heart if I heard one of Isaiah's friends coming up in here like, yo, this cop just pulled a gun on, my son, on your son, Isaiah. I do not know how I would react to that. I want to say I would do this and do that, but I do not know how I would react. Right. I, I, I've been known to lose it 
when it comes to I, I might see black and I might get myself killed just trying to save my son. Mm-hmm. Well, I would need to know how to premeditate how to handle that situation. But it's crazy. We shouldn't have to do that. Yeah. That, that's the main issue right That's there. That's not a feeling that you should have. Mm-hmm. As, a, as a father, as a father and being a father to a child that's black, you should, and a son, mm-hmm. you should not, by the time Isaiah gets of age, you should not have to sit Isaiah down right. and have a conversation with him and the conversation be like this. Well, when you're approached by a police officer, make sure your hands are in full view at all right. times. Don't be fidgety. Mm-hmm. Always say it like, I can guarantee you your Caucasian counterparts, mm-hmm. they're not having that conversation. Yeah. And if they tell you that they're having that conversation, they're lying to yeah. you. You know, I'm not going to say 100% of them are not, mm-hmm. but if they are or not, they're, it, it's, a, it's a proven fact that we need to be telling them a little bit harder if they are mm-hmm. uh, to be more exclusive about it because th- our situation might lead into life or death. Right. There's at the most go to go to jail for a night. Yeah, at the yeah. most, you, you, you'll be in, like like son, you'll be in jail for it. You, you'll be in jail for it. I got hours. the bail money, or they'll just let you out. Exactly, you know. You know. Yeah. Us, it's like yeah, make sure your hands aren't, make sure you're not fidgeting. Mm-hmm. You know, com- comply. Comply. And you know, know, like that. I, I hate that term. That's, if you didn't comply, we wouldn't got shot. Exactly. No. It's not always like that. Like, definitely not always like that. <laughs> Ask Philando Castile. Right. Like he, like, he he complied and even let the officer know. Like, mm-hmm. because that's what you're supposed to do. They trained you that. They trained you for that in concealed weapons license class. I have a gun in the vehicle. I'm licensed. Mm-hmm. It's in the glove compartment. Let me grab it out so that way you know I have this right. firearm. When that situation, I always wonder, like, um, how the NRA goes so hard for gun rights and none of them spoke up on that situation. Okay. And that was that was baffling to me. Yeah. Because <laughs> that fits that fits into your whole entire platform. Absolutely. But because the complexion mm. doesn't fit the direction that you want to go in, then that's that's an issue. That's a problem. So yeah, that's, true, man. that's crazy. Um you spoke on the, the um beginning of Black Lives Matter Mm -hmm. and you spoke about um, uh, Trayvon Martin's situation which is in my opinion still like it blows me to this day that this man um, Zimmerman is walking the streets we want to fight each other and kill each other all day but this guy is walking the streets I'm not promoting to kill this man or beat him up or nothing but just it just it baffles me how comfortable this man's living his life oh yeah Um, you actually met Trayvon's mom I have Um, how was that it was literally like two, two maybe three months after mm-hmm. everything happened, um, and myself and a friend of mine who was actually working on helping me to work on my album at the time, we drove, we drove from Panama City all the way down to Sanford, Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, Jamal Bryant and Jamal Bryant and Al Sharpton were having a rally there, but the rally also was on the same day that Sanford City Council was meeting about the direction that they were going to take with the police department and their lack of investigating this case. Um, so we were outside for the rally. Rally's over with. Myself and my friend were walking away and standing in front of me is Sabrina Fulton and um, Tray- Trayvon's father, Mr. Martin. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm standing there and you know she looked at me and she was just like, I thank you, you know, thank you for coming. Um, you know, where did you come, you know, where where did you come from? And I was like, I said we came from um, Panama City, Florida. It's kinda like near I told her it was like near Tallahassee, Pensacola area. She was like, Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with Panama City. She was like, You came all the way from there, I was like, Yes, ma'am. And she was like, For my son? And I was like, Ma'am, I le- legitimately could have been your son. Like legit could have been your son. And I gave her like the quick cliff note version of what happened to me and she was like Wow, she was like so, and I was like, "But ma'am, that was like back in 
2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's 2013. Yeah. It's still going on in the state. It, this is still going on in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was just like, I just, I appreciate you coming. She was like, I just didn't really understand. She's like, I don't really understand still how big of an issue this is for, for people. I was like, well, we've all gotten to the point now. It's like we're tired. Yeah. And, and I think now, in 2017, we have to get back to that point of we're tired. Um, because I think the point that we're at now is not that we're tired. It's that this is going to keep, this is going to always happen. Uh -huh. And the result of what happens, that's mm -hmm. going to always happen. Meaning, they're going to always keep shooting us, mm -hmm. and they're going to always get off. Right. You just said that uh, this is always going to be happening to mm -hmm. us, and we want to change, like, try to make a ripple effect to change it, and, mm -hmm. and no matter what, by all means. I had a conversation with my mom about, about this. My mother is a black woman. And she she was born in the 50s, was a child in the 60s, kind of grown in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I, I asked her, I was like, what do you think about stuff like Colin Kaepernick, about Black Lives Matter, you know, all these all these social issues that have to do with race? And she said, um, she said with a straight face that black people have been treated wrong since we've been brought here to Africa from America to America. That's how it is, and that's how it always will be. And she said that, she acknowledged that there was a problem, but she seemed like she's at an age where she's just like, you know what, what, what can you do about it? Right. And that kind of broke my heart a little bit. That, uh, that you're like settling, that you just like, you know, the, just, 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 just do what you do, get your money and go home, don't mm -hmm. worry about it. And it, that kind of reminded me of a quote Pop said, that when you get to a certain age, they, they pull out the spirit of a black man mm -hmm. on it. And I feel that's happened to my mother, and I feel that's happened to a lot of people her age and above. Right. And I, I really hope that not just you, but other people that, that are um, active like you don't ever lose that spirit, seriously. And that's why I keep myself around individuals a little younger or a lot younger than I. Um, because they keep me in a place of don't lose that, don't lose that fervor, don't right. lose that fight. Because if you lose, like, like I literally have had someone tell me, like, if you lose it, then like we're done. Right. And uh, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people here within this city felt as though when felt as though when I moved. And I walked away that the movement as far as here mm -hmm. walked away. And I told them, I was like, no, it's it's plenty of other organizations within Bay County that fight, you know. Cause my, my primary my primary focus is black youth. Mm -hmm. um, and there's plenty of organizations in this in this County that fights for black youth, whether it's Save Our Youth, whether it's Judo's, um, whether I mean even the, even the NAACP um, to a certain extent, like it's plenty of organizations and plenty of individuals that you know they fight for our, our youth. Miss um, Dinah Creighton, um, she's the vice president of the local NAACP chapter here. Um, I think one of her main like one of her main points on her platform for social justice is um, school to prison pipeline, and that's how come me and her we get along so well because um, that's a real issue for me. Also, knowing that from the moment your child hits school, because of the zero tolerance policy, your child is likely to be punished three times harsher than their Caucasian counterpart. And it's because of it's because of the skin color, mm -hmm. like because you know, little Rashad and little Timmy could be in the back 
you know, smoking a blunt, little Timmy might get detention at the most. Rashad, he getting out of school suspension. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if his out of school suspension is longer than 10 days, especially here in the state of Florida, that's your whole semester. And, and when you're in out of school suspension, they're not going to let you do your schoolwork at home. Mm. Your semester shot is done. That's terrible. And it's just a ripple mm-hmm. effect. Mm-hmm. Ripple, ripple, ripple effect until those same individuals that were punished three times worse in school, they're now being punished three times worse in the justice system. Yeah. It's a it's it's a pipeline. Ooh. It's, 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 a, it's a whole. This is besides it being besides it being just a race issue. This is a money issue. Oh yeah, it's a real money issue because I don't know if people notice, um, but the medicinal marijuana is now legal in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. But. It's taking them a long time to um, get things set in motion mm-hmm. here in Bay County. And, and it's, it's sad, I mean, to interrupt you, mm-hmm. but I'm hearing from the political side, too, they're trying to reverse that. And they are. That's really sad. And they are. But if they don't reverse it, then at the latest, September or October, before any type of dispensary start getting here mm-hmm. and then a whole nother year before those dispensaries can actually be open mm-hmm. and the reason behind that or in, in my viewpoint one of the reasons behind that is because if you if you allow medicinal marijuana in the state of Florida primarily in Bay County you're gaining you're gaining a revenue maker Mm-hmm. But you're losing one as well, because the main one that you're losing is the prison system. Hmm. Because we get so much money per day right. for every prisoner that we have in the prison system, mm-hmm. and I can guarantee you that seventy-five to eighty percent of the people, especially here in Bay County that's locked up is locked up for marijuana. That's very true. And you know, it's crazy. Um, I said this on a podcast with James. Mm-hmm. I've been around everybody of every race in this town because I'm being close to the military base. I've been very open-minded and all that right. stuff. I've been around all of them. Blacks, whites, Spanish, Middle Eastern, Asian, all of them. They're all committing crimes equally. All equally. Everybody is doing bad things and doing good things equally. Right. But that justice system and that prison system is full of put African Americans. Mm-hmm. And, and, <laughs> and and here's the thing. Um, we want to focus so much on we want to focus so much on black on black crime. What is that anyway? That <laughs> which crime that is crime. In itself is which that in itself is a ridiculous term. Yes. Um in a, in a self and it's a very racist term. It's stupid. In itself. What about black on black crime? Black, black, black crime. No. Nobody yells out what about white on white crime. No. Exactly. Crime happens usually it's it's gonna be it's gonna go through people that's usually within your area status. Exactly. If you're a black person that lives around a lot of black people, of course the crime you commit is going to be if, around another black person. But, Same with white people. And if and if they they feel they feel it's worse within our they feel it's worse within our community. Um, but I heard a, um, it was a, it was a pastor friend of mine, we was having this discussion and he was telling me, well, um, there were a group of scientists, they did this experiment, they did it with like four rats, Mm -hmm. a mom rat, father rat, and the kids. Um, you kept giving them food, kept giving the rats food, kept giving the rats food, and you know, they, they have their resources. This food is their resource. After so after so many weeks and then so many months, you damn put these rats in a confined area. Mm-hmm. 
I've heard of this. And the food rations start going down. Mm. Now it's not enough food for those four rats. Mm. And now it gets to the point where the adult rats are fighting amongst themselves. And then the adult rats are fighting their children because you put them in this confined area with limited resources mm -hmm. and limited things for them to do to keep them from fighting amongst themselves. That's I don't know if people I don't know if people realize, but that's really familiar. That's the project all day, man. You're a product of your own environment. And that what you just said was a project mm -hmm. and they named the whole thing the, the projects. projects. Do you think that's a coincidence that you even said? I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but what you just said was actual facts. That's real. Like this, 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 can be look, this can be looked up. Yeah. Um, redlining, can, redlining can be looked up. Mm -hmm. They redlined housing districts in certain areas, certain areas of the country. This particular area is only for people who can afford upscale housing and then we'll put everyone else in this area mm. and that area in those areas are divided by a red line on the map um, don't take his word for it though look it up okay red line red line it look it up i wanted okay um let's move on to your faith um, would you call yourself a Christian? I would actually. Okay, cool. Um, how how hard is it nowadays in society being a black man in a conscious society where you feel, well, I feel as well that you you claim to be this in this organization called Christianity, but and there's a lot of white people and other people of different races in your group, but you feel like you might be alone when it comes to issues like social issues and justice issues. Right. How does it feel also to have other people of your same race maybe not believe in God or they follow a different different um, thing and they might look at you differently for believing in a white God or the white man's God and stuff like that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, first off, it's, it's, very, it's very silly to me to have individuals of individuals of African descent want to want to um, defame Christianity, defame placing your faith in Jesus when if you do research on individuals who actually wrote certain books of the Bible most of the people who wrote certain books of the Bible are of African descent. Mm -hmm. um, Luke, one of the greatest physicians ever, and the, the author of the book of Luke is from the continent of Africa. I'm glad you said a lot of people know that Luke is a physician. Mm -hmm. You're smart. Yeah. Um, You've done your research. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> um, I, I just recently found that out within the last two years. So yeah. That's why I was interested. I'm glad you said that. A lot of people know that. Paul, man, Paul wrote two thirds of the New Testament, mm -hmm. and in one of the chapters, I mean, in one of the books that Paul wrote, um, it was said that Paul, it was said that Paul was confused. Like someone looked at Paul and they confused Paul to be an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know about you. But I was about to say, do you want to remind people where Egypt, Palestine, <laughs> Bethlehem, um, Nineveh? You want to remind everybody on the map globally where that is? <laughs> right around in the North African, Middle Eastern, exactly. North African, Middle Eastern area. Yes. Which, if people did research on that as well, they would that they would also know that um, the Middle East only became the Middle East um, in the early AD. Mm -hmm. early AD period and that before the Middle East was actually a part of Africa right um, so I mean like you know and I don't um, here's the thing I don't know if it's a I don't know if it's a metaphorical um, a metaphor 
metaphorical description of Jesus or a literal description of Jesus. I happen to think the latter, but um, hair like lamb's wool and feet like brass. In the Bible, I don't particularly think that's the picture of Jerry. Yeah, that's <laughs> floating all around churches. Yeah, in churches in America. Mm. Um, well, let me ask you a serious question to that because I wanted to transition into. Um, white Jesus or black Jesus. Right. Okay, so I personally, a while ago, and it's actually stemmed from a conversation me, you, and Robert Mitchell had. Right. Um, I, I, Shout out to Robert, by the way. Yeah, very smart dude, one Great of my good awesome friends. Yeah. Um, it's, I never looked at it from when he brought up, he's like, what, why do we, why do we allow this white Jesus on the wall? Mm -hmm. Why do we allow this image of Jesus on the wall? Right. Because we know that this is not him. Nobody know. Nobody had cameras back then. Nobody knows who what he looked like. So why is it always brought back to him? You even hit the Google search. You just write Jesus, and then that's the picture that's that comes the picture up. That always comes up. And you know it's crazy. What he was saying made a lot of sense because if you want to take the race issue out of it, being wherever he's from, what his race actually was, we can argue that all day that it was uh, either Middle Eastern or black. My the point that he was making though is. That's kind of blasphemous what we do when we put an image of God or image of Jesus on a wall. Now, and, you know, we can we can argue again the, the race thing about it, but why are you putting a, a, a false image of Jesus Christ on the wall, whether he is black or white? Well, I mean, well, first, first and foremost, you know, it's, it's even stated in the Bible to not mm -hmm. worship the image. Absolutely. Or worship the Savior. Absolutely. Um, second thing, looking at it from a looking at it from a natural natural perspective mm -hmm. um, you can go and, and th this is well documented as well you can go to every other continent mm -hmm. in the world and whatever the people look like that's what Jesus looks like right the only area that that's not the case is the whole continent of Africa in the United and the United States of America, um, and the reason being is because is because the next thing that I that I'm going to get to when it comes to um, this Westernized version of Christianity, we allow we've allowed the image mm -hmm. to mean more than the actual contributions of the person of course um, and the actual spirit that's supposed to dwell within mm -hmm. quite frankly I don't worship the image anyway of course nobody should but the thing is is that if if I if, if I put you in an, if I put you in an area where I put you in an area where the people who look like you have done damaging and demeaning things to you, or at least you feel that way, but the person who doesn't look like you is viewed as this person who came and took us out of this awful predicament that we were in, and, you know, we were great, you know, now we're living great, now we're living wonderful. Who are you going to eventually put more of your faith in? Well, the one that uh, made, you, made your life even better. So, if, if I keep feeding you this situation of the condition that you're in, even though certain situations of this condition are very inhumane in how you're being treated, mm -hmm. but the person that is supposed to pull you out of that situation and help you overcome that situation doesn't look like you, <laughs> eventually what you're going to think is, is that everybody that's going to pull me out of a negative situation is going to be someone who doesn't look like me, mm, and that's that. <laughs> and that's the that's the psychological effect I got you. of why Jesus 
the Christ, mm -hmm. whatever image that you present to your children mm -hmm. or present to believers, the psychological effect of it, that's why the psychological effect of it is you should present an image that is more of who you are. Okay. Because that way you don't feel as though we don't get into this effect of you and I right. are second class citizens. That's and good. because we're in this project, mm -hmm. we now have to fight for survival. We now have to fight for survival. Right. in the project. No. You're a king hmm. and right. you deserve to be treated as such. Women, you are queens and you deserve to be treated. You deserve to be treated as such. Mm -hmm. And but more than anything, um the the one who created you and the one whose spirit resides within you wants you to recognize just how much of a king and queen that you are and just how much of a god that you are because it's 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 stated in his word we are made in his we are made in his image and i love what erica badu said and on and on if we are made in his image call us by a name call me the n-word call me by call me by my name I'm a child, if I'm a child of God mm -hmm. and I was created to have dominion and rule over the earth, mm -hmm. because that's what that's what men and women, we were created to have dominion and rule over the earth. Okay. And the only person and the only entity that we were supposed to answer to is God. So you would say that and I agree with everything you said because mm -hmm. I, I've actually had lessons on this. We are gods made in his image. So we're actually a reflection of a higher power, lowercase g's. That's mm -hmm. what we are. Okay, I got what you're saying. Exactly. So with that being said, now it's time for me to drill you, okay? Mm -hmm. Why would you call another man a cook if we're God? You have this hashtag going on, this ongoing hashtag yeah. called the Coon Train. Get on the Coon Train. There's a lot of people. That, that thing's getting full from <laughs> your point of view. So, <laughs> you want to explain, <laughs> explain what the Coon Train is and why you're continually doing this? Um, the Coon Train <laughs> um, is my... Um, and actually, I wasn't even the one who, who invented this. Okay. Um, Tariq Nasheed. Tariq Nasheed is the um, individual who who is the creator of he's the creator of the DVD series known as Hidden Colors. Okay. Um, I know that is. Hidden Colors, awesome, awesome, awesome DVD series. Um, but every year he like look it up on YouTube. It's fun. It's hilarious as I'll get out. Every year he has this award show and it's called the, the Coon Train Awards. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll look into that. Yeah. And it's called the Coon Train Awards. Um, so what is your purpose of your personal series of the Coon Train? Coon Train. It's people who I feel you cape it too hard for <laughs> you cape it too hard for the man, bro. It's like like yeah man, okay, I understand that everything doesn't have to be about race but bruh like you really like some of these people like i i kind of feel like you'd have been the house negro <laughs> on some real life you'd have, you'd have been that guy so they would have been samson they would have been they'd have been, they been stephen from Django. Stephen, stephen from yeah. Jango, so I'm gonna say. they'd, stephen stephen from Jango, Jango, they'd, they'd have been uncle ruckus and yeah. been, um what's What's uh Dave Chappelle's character? Clay oh, Clay Bixby. Yeah, they're kind of low key. They're kind of low key, man. Cato. But see, here's uh, the thing. I like. I don't know. Kato. I understand. Yeah. Cato's purpose in yeah. underground. Awesome. Oh, he's about himself. He, he, the last episode, he's all like, "I'm not a nigga." Yeah. I'm Kato. Exactly. It seems like he's not. He's not with black or white. He's just trying to survive. I'm just trying to get I his money. Get, yeah. <laughs> I get what he's. I get it too. Yeah. But like, no, man. Like, okay, so. Let's okay. So let's throw some examples out. Most recent example: Jason Whitlock. 
<laughs> Jason Whitlock is a new uh, is a sports reporter on Fox Sports One. Okay, now there you go. I forgot who his name was. Yeah, but yeah I know where you're going with this. So got um, dunked today. Yes, yes, and that was if you. Ever watch Donkey of the Day? Yes. In my opinion, that's yeah. top three Donkey of the Days oh, in the existence in. of oh, yeah. that segment. He went in. Like, he really went in. <laughs> and he had, in my personal opinion, he had every right to. Yeah. Because here's the thing. Everybody wants to say, oh, LeVar Bell was disrespectful in how he approached Christian Leahy. You don't talk about how people are raising are raising their kids. Yeah, that's the first thing. As a father as well, I'll bring it back to that. Every time every time I that makes me flinch and grit my teeth when somebody tells you, you know, you need to raise your kid this way. It's no wrong way of raising your children. Exactly. Of course you don't need to molest them or beat them and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But when it comes to their personal way they uh, raise their kids, mind your business. Yeah. That's none of your business. So I mean so here's the thing, like one of the things that she brought up was it's very rare that you have three um, that you have three sons and all of them want to do the exact same thing. They all want to play basketball. And she kept playing they're scared. Yeah, they're scared of him. No, they're not that's not <laughs> you don't know them. That, that's, that's not rare. I give a prime, I can give a prime example. So before before I moved, one of one of my pastors here in Panama City is um, Bishop JWA. Over at Pentecostal Worship Center. Mr. Wade has three sons. Mm-hmm. All of them at one time or another, either in high school or in college, played basketball. Mm-hmm. Jay now owns two barbershops. Yeah, yeah. On the verge of probably opening up a third one in a whole other in a whole other city. Like he's literally making this a brand. Mm-hmm. John, middle son, played two years at Gulf Coast. When he played D1 ball at North Norfolk State. Being looked at for the, being looked at for the NBA, awesome. that awesome of a player, Josh, baby, baby son, same deal. He's at Gulf Coast right now, possibly looking at playing D one ball after his two years at Gulf Coast. Like, right. no, this isn't this isn't a rarity. Like, <laughs> if you're over five eleven, six two. It's one of two things that you want to, and you're black. It's one of two things that you want to do. You want to play basketball, or if I can bulk up, yeah. I'm going to play football. See, that, that door is open widely for them. It's, it's not widely for me. No, yeah. it's definitely not. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> that door is not, they, they close the door. Hey, where do you think you're going, young blood? Oh, I want to play basketball. Nah, yeah. nah, nah. Stick with the jokes. Yeah, just, 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 just stick with the rock, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. But no, so... For her, so okay, so for the barbell to come on the show and approach her the way that he did, I think he handled the situation right. Mm-hmm. And the reason I say that he handled the situation right is because that is because he knew, like, if I keep doing this back and forth with you, I'm gonna look like the bad guy. In the, I'm gonna look like the bad yeah. guy. Yeah, and I do remember he said, uh, "I'm scared of you." Exactly. I'm scared of you because, because he knew. That's right. If if I don't if I don't have like I'm scared of you I'm gonna and I keep person. yeah I'm gonna be the angry black dude yeah and that's what Charlemagne brought up when he gave her donkey of the day yeah here comes Jason Whitlock yeah well, I know this what. came out of nowhere yeah I just yeah he, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm gonna say this I'm gonna defend her a little bit I'm not defending him at all because no. he deserved that donkey I'm gonna defend her just a little bit mm-hmm. and Charlemagne touched on this and I noticed it from the clip yeah. She she might be ignorant, yeah. which is true. I don't think they're treating her right as well. And he mentioned the part that how they put her way in the back and stuff like that. Exactly. And um, for I think he made a good point of showing them like you know what this is a this is how they treat us like in the media and stuff like that and how the whole he gave him until example stuff like that. He's like, and he broke it down like but. That, what they're doing to you is they're putting you in the back where they think you need to be. <laughs> they're all like, you have a different issue you need to worry about. Mm-hmm. And that's why I defend her a little bit. Like, you know what? Uh, I think that might have been a good wake up call for her. Like, you know what? He's not being treated well, neither am I. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, let me, like, let me think about this. Let me yeah. think about this for a minute. Like, exactly. It's like that. When Laura Bell was on there, that may have been the third time I've actually watched Colin, Colin Coward's show. I've never watched it, man. This is why I brought the product. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, 
Yeah, every time she's actually on the show. Yeah. Because she's not on the show every day. But every time she's actually on the show, way the heck over there. That's where she's at. Like, I was this, so confused on that. Like this is Colin Coward. Yeah. All the way over here, mm-hmm. it's Christian. I was like, more more women should be upset about that. that in my opinion. Let's, let's just take away the issue of the ignorant things she said mm-hmm. and how it could have been deadly, like Charlie was saying. Exactly. But like, I think more women should be upset. Why? What? What is the reason for that? That doesn't <laughs> make any sense. No, it's okay. If I have, if me, if this is my show, the intellectual controversy, and <laughs> I had, if I had a female on my show and I put her way in that room over there, I'm like, hey, so what? What's your opinion on the matter? And she just shouting back. Well, you this guys, is- <laughs> you guys would be like, oh, can you bring her closer to the camera so we can hear? Her? Yeah, they hit, they hit you up on Instagram and Facebook tomorrow. Like, right. so you just, you just gonna let. Yeah, you, you just gonna let Tawana just be all the way in the back of the huh? <laughs> That's how we doing it today. Okay then, like we 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 see what yeah. podcast we're not gonna listen to from now on. Absolutely, so. yeah, that's that's true, man. So and yeah, what he's you were saying, I a lot of your crew trains I think are comical. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna hop on there and talk about it, but that one was, in my opinion, he deserved a first class ticket. <laughs> He deserves a lifetime seat. Yeah, because because a- just I mean just like Charlamagne said, that's not the only time. Oh yeah, that he's done this. He was talking about uh, right. Colin Kaepernick and he tried. He compared Colin to Trump. Yeah, House way. No, 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 LeBron. LeBron. He, he compared LeBron. Of course. Like yeah, House <laughs> <way. laughs> And then and then said that Serena Williams has to raise like a horse. Mm. In order for her to be able to fit into her tent, fit into her tennis outfit, it's like that's that's beyond sexist, right there. Like what, like, what are we, like, what are we doing? <laughs> but it's like but that's yeah, Fox News, you know, that's that's it's, Fox Network, it's, it's Fox Sports One. You get what you pay for on that one, Definitely. no matter what the race is. Definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, like, cause this is the one of the ones that we disagreed on. We may still disagree on this one, but. Probably not. I don't know because we ain't talked about this one, this person in a while. But I'll say Steve. yes. I'll, <laughs> I'll say this. My when it came to his past accomplishments, mm-hmm. I'm still going to side with Steve. Right. Um, he's got the Steve Harvey Foundation. He's done a lot for the youth communities. I've looked it all up before I even exactly. made my comments. I will say this though. My opinions have changed a little bit about Steve within recent events about how he treats his employees. I, I was not feeling that at all. And so I wouldn't put him on a coon train for that because <laughs> of how much he's done for people. So that's mm-hmm. where we might disagree. But I'm starting to rethink my stance of him as a human being for the way he's treating his employees. And see, the reason, and see the reason I'm sticking him on there is because like within the last couple of months, like he's just been heavy caping for Donald Trump. Like Donald Trump. He, all the promises that he made me, he's fulfilling his promises. Okay, well, you still being able to host Miss Universe and mm-hmm. still get money from Trump Enterprises, I guess he did so, okay, fulfill his promise. With that situation with Trump, <laughs> I'm going to say this about it. I'm not 100% with him on that because I, I think I told you once, I'm not, I wouldn't be ready to talk to Trump at this time. No. I'd be open to it, maybe, but right now I'm still... I still have a lot of anger for him. There's no way the conversation would be intelligent if I had a conversation right now. I'm st- I still want to maybe wait to see what that because I'm curious of where that's going. Right. And if it seems like it's just a profitable thing and you know that it's like not a selfish act, then yes, I'll be like, all right, Steve Harvey. And this and this was my thing. This was my thing that I was bringing up to a lot of people. Um, I can't see. I can't see these people going into this meeting with Trump and the first thing that gets introduced on the table is, okay, so let's discuss how you handled people of color and disenfranchised people during your campaign. I can't see that being brought up in these conversations. And the reason being is because everybody that he's had meetings with, these people have come out and did photo ops. Hey, you know, look at my good friend Steve Harvey yeah. over here. Look at my good friend Kanye West Kanye over West here. Still you know, the place. yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, it's my camera. <laughs> <laughs> but 
I can't see you having these conversations and it's starting off with that. Mm -hmm. Because if it starts because if you start a conversation off with me mm -hmm. about something that I did that was disrespectful and out of line, mm -hmm. and I didn't think it was disrespectful and out of line, mm -hmm. I guarantee you we're not going to have a photo op well, after right. the end of the meeting. You're right about that. Uh, some people are different. I'm, I will check someone real quick. Yeah. I don't know how Steve is about his how gangster Steve can get. I don't know. Right. So, but I don't know. I'm gonna wait and see. He's <laughs> he's on the line with me right now, especially oh. with the employee thing. Because yeah. I was backing him, and he made me in five minutes, He made me look bad when it, all this stuff started coming out. I was like, all right, I don't know. That if was out of line. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if I want to keep defending this guy because I I really respect what he has done for children and in the black community as well. But like you know, we'll see. We will see. Right now, you're on thin ice with me, Steve. I was. Like you said, me and him had a disagreement about that, but right now it's not looking good it's for you on my side, though. Not so you play in these streets, Steve. it's <laughs> not. It's not. You know, the, don't make me look bad. If you, I will, I, I will admit I'm wrong about a situation about a per certain person, and I, and I will be like, I will apologize to Jamil and say he was right. But right now, we'll, we'll just we'll just see how that goes. We're, we're, we're gonna we do that right I'm now. I'm with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, before we head out, though, I wanna um, I wanna ask you two things. Um, Let's see here. Who are your hip hop influences? Because you are indeed an artist and a poet as well. Who who influences you as an artist? Um, Nas. I can see that. I get a lot of like the way I come off is charismatic and very stylish on the mic and just stylish in general. Like I get that from Big Daddy Kane. Mm -hmm. um, my southern influence is definitely. Andre 3000 and Scarface. I would have thought you would have said Killer Mike. I was waiting for them. Um, my political okay influence that makes sense then. is Mike and Chuck D. Okay. Um, I had the actual pleasure of when I was 15, yeah, 15 years old. I met Chuck D and Shannon Ball. Awesome. Um, and you know we sat down, I had a conversation, and I walked away from that like. Need to put a little bit more um, social commentary into into my art. Okay. Um, and, but that was at at the age of fifteen. So um, yeah, and Andre three thousand more. Andre three thousand more because of me being from Atlanta and me having that um, close dungeon family influence um, because my cousin. Is, um, my cousin Sleepy Brown, awesome. and so a lot of like the beginnings of organizing the ways and how the Dungeon Family came to be. If you haven't seen it yet, go on Netflix and watch the Art of Organized Noise. It's an incredible documentary about organized noise and about the honestly just the birth of how Atlanta hip hop came to be, mm -hmm. um, and the birth of the Dungeon Family. But a lot of the things that occurs in that documentary, I saw those firsthand. Like um he Helen and Delo, my dad right now still lives off uh, off of Helen and Delo. Okay. So like, you know, Andre saying in elevators one for the money, two for the show a couple of years ago on Helen and Delo. Yeah, like I know where all these places all these places are at. Um so you just want to be that person that brings the story of where you're from to the limelight so that everybody can hear it. Right. So, um, yeah, those are like real, 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 real strong influences are primarily those, those six people. That I, I can see all those of you, honestly. Yeah. Can you leave us with either a poem or a freestyle, man, so these people can know your artistic methods? Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I believe I can do that. All right, hit me. Um, I actually leave with the poem "Stand Your Ground." Stand your ground. Um, that that's 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 a pretty appropriate. And before appropriate you start standing your ground, uh, I want I want to let y'all know that I've heard it like from the beginning, mm -hmm. and that and that gets it gets longer, and it shouldn't get longer at the end. It really shouldn't get longer. But uh, yeah, hit them with it. Man. Um, I got a letter from the government the other day. 
I opened it and read you our new target of prey. See, turning our black youth away from disarray and encouraging success within the lyrics you display. That's a heinous sex. See your kind, we make examples out you. Can't be stupid to think Pac and Big were the fiercest rivals who became famous side notes in the historic lyrical war that caused the double homicidal conclusion. See, Pac influenced the revolution that on the surface looked like our behavior brewing. But in reality, through all the insanity, gangs were calling truces and prisoners lived in peaceful ruin. So Big's an unknown pawn in the quiet shooting. Pop blamed him. Vegas, yeah, that was our doing. Couldn't let Big get a sudden change of heart. So in L.A., we split his wig apart to allow ignorance to move in. But see what you're doing? Bad move. Making known goons reconsider their course of action. Community involvement with spiritual satisfaction. Looks like someone wants a visit from our new assassin. We gave you ungrateful heathens a president. A false sense of change. And look at the thanks we get. Cease your movement or we cause harm. No excuses. Don't get brave. You've been warned. Well now, didn't realize I caused such a ruckus. I felt the sense of pride knowing that I'm wrongfully punished. So I grabbed my pen, breathe deep within. To whom it may concern my response to your plea of rubbish. Must this be the cause of my downfall? Being the voice that exposes why I sound and all? No amount of promise, profit from major label conglomerates can silence this honest commentary of the lives you bury. The Matthew Henry within me cries when it's necessary. Then devises a demise that some would deem legendary. So the rise this set cloth is heavy. Period of intense mourning was serious. Now that respects a pay, my remembrance is not finished. See, I will be the leper who decided to rise and proclaim to simply not sit till I die. See, this is Malcolm if the Autobahn didn't allow that shotgun. Martin if he didn't meet his pain at Lorraine. I've reemerged the vessel of change. Blame Zimmerman and Sam for forward knife in this flame. I go hard in the paint. 92 Shack version. Merciless and disturbing, that good old boy system. Plus, might I mention, alone I'll never stand. I have yet revealed my hand, but those cards I play, they interesting. See, vicious henchmen, I am against them. Clowns continue when they menstruating, I will finish them. Yeah, your money's in its infant stage, but consciously, is that where your mind state will stay in? While I compose this revolution through prose, can't be televised thanks to these companies who've controlled and sucked out the soul. But for those who've forgotten, my message resonates for the ill downtrodden. See, this is for Jordan Davis, Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant, Antonio Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Rakia Boyd, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, John Crawford, Terrence Crutcher, Walter Scott, Renita McBride, Freddie Gray, Deborah Danner, Michelle Shirley, Corinne Gaines, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Victor Steen, Eric Henley, Jordan Edwards, and Martin Lee Anderson watching. Over our souls, Constance, as they ain't talking, I keep a loaded 16 blazed out often. In this life, I believe there's no room for escape, but the OG Big Rube taught me something great. He said, either stand for something or die for nothing. Jamal Steele, right on to the real and death to the faith. Peace out. Mm. Good, brother. Good, brother. Indeed, sir. I love that song, man. This is my favorite <laughs> off that album. Man, man I appreciate it, man. Hey, man, I really appreciate you coming through, man. This was a great conversation. Can't wait to post this. Can't wait for you guys to get to know this man a little bit more. Indeed. And he might be a misunderstood. He might be exactly what you wanted, man. You know, but he's a great friend, and I love it. Every time we come together, it's a celebration, man. Every time. <laughs> All, right, you, man. Man. All right, man. Come holler at me. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud. I'll be posting. What would you like to plug any of your uh, social hey, man, media? Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. It's all Jamal Steele. Jamal Steele. Yeah. 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 SoundCloud, same deal. SoundCloud.com, Jamal Steel. Bandcamp is jamalsteel.bandcamp.com. Um, I appreciate being on the Electro Controverse, and I appreciate you all deciding to get acquainted with greatness. Thank you. All right.